today. Jonah is one of the minor prophets, but Jonah is one of the most familiar of the books. You probably know the story of Jonah. The book of Jonah, why it stands out, is the most familiar story to us, is because everything that's happening in the book of Jonah is unlike any other story the Bible is telling. Everything is upside down. Everything is wrong. This is a story about a prophet who doesn't do what God is telling him to do. He is rebelling. And then all the pagans who are supposed to be doing the wrong thing, or at least traditionally, they don't do what is right. They are the ones that are soft-hearted. They are the ones turning to God. We see a pagan king humble himself. We even see him ordering the cows to repent before God. This is an upside-down story when we um, go through the book of Jonah, that even the pagans are repenting, and the prophet, the man of God, is rebellious. So before we start, I'm just going to pray really fast for us. Father, I just want to thank you for the story that is so familiar to many of us, uh, but help us to see the truth and see it for the application it is for our lives today and really how this story shows us the true and better Jonah in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the message of your grace and for your mercy. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know, but my personal story when it comes to the book of Jonah is that I was actually taught that the book of Jonah was not was not a really literal story that actually happened. Yeah, Dorothea, can you go back? <laughs> I feel maybe Eden can help you there. I don't have them. So I was taught that Jonah was not an actual story. My mother, she is a great theologian herself. She <coughs> has, knows the Bible. But she's also an anthropologist. She loves science. So she did teach us that some of these stories in the Old Testament, they were used to teach like a moral lesson. Not necessarily that someone actually got swallowed by a fish at one point in history. But the more I dug into Jonah in my lifetime, the more I came on my own conclusion that Jonah is a very much true story that did happen the way it plays out in the Bible here. What got me to that decision is really the words of Jesus himself, because Jesus makes a reference to Jonah in Matthew chapter 12, and he doesn't talk about Jonah like it's one of his parables that he's saying. He's talking about Jonah like because Jonah ha this happened to Jonah, the same thing is going to happen to the Son of Man. It's going to happen to me. So that is our biggest evidence that Jonah is really a real character. But if you think, still think that Jonah could be just like a parable, a moral story, you know what? That is okay. Growing up in a household that has like two um, parents of two different denominations, our motto was like, in the beginning, God. And with God... This is all possible. We know the path to salvation that is through God's Son. And so we can disagree on the little stuff. But when it comes to, like, how do we get to heaven? How do we have that personal relationship <coughs> with Jesus? We are on the same page. So maybe you don't believe that Jonah is, like, really happened. He was in the belly of a fish for three days. I'm not going to say you're going to hell for that. You're not. That is not going to prevent you from getting into heaven. But there is so much we can learn from the story of Jonah and to see what happens. Many of you are thinking, the one thing that makes people think this is more of a parable, is more of a moral story, is how could somebody actually be in the belly of a fish for three days? And so I like to take a look at the scientific evidence. Is that even possible? And believe it or not, it actually is. The circumstances are like astronomical, like, wow, that, what are the odds? But it could happen. So fish or whale, some people, in the Bible it says fish, but we could think of it as a whale because whales really weren't given the name until much, much later 
when people started categorizing mammals to fish, to invertebrates, that was categories really came in the 17th century. So what they saw as a fish or a royal fish back in the 8th century BC, that could have been a whale that they're referring to in the story. Or it could have been a fish that God created just for this purpose. And there's many extinct animals that we have not explored yet, as we know more about the surface of our moon than we do about the surface ocean floors right now. So yes, there are sea creatures we don't even have listed. But let's point out to the sperm whale here. The sperm whale is one of the only known species that has a throat large enough that could swallow a human whole. They do swallow gigantic squids whole, like one sperm whale was cut open and they found a 400 pound squid still alive in its stomach. So, is it possible for them to swallow a human? Actually, in 1891, there was a story, a legend, you would say, of a man off the coast of the Falkland Islands who fell overboard and allegedly was swallowed by a sperm whale. And three days later, that whale was harpooned. And as they were cutting up this whale, out comes this man, all like bleach white from the gaseous um, acids that was in the man's stomach. His hair was gone. So I think of Smeagol from the Lord of the Rings as this guy is coming out. But he was alive. Now, this was 1891. They didn't have pics. So you're like, probably like, pics or it didn't happen. Maybe it didn't happen, maybe it was an urban legend, but the New York Times reported about this man who was in the stomach of a whale for three days. Or just a couple years ago, this is a lobster fisher off the coast of Maine. He was in the water when a humpback whale actually got him in his mouth. And he was in the humpback whale's mouth for about 40 seconds before he was able to get the whale to spit him up or release him and he was okay. So there are really weird stories out there, if you look at it, that yes, it is possible, even though it's very unlikely, but with God, nothing is impossible. With God, he could have made a fish just for this purpose, with a stomach big enough and enough air down there, yes, somebody could have survived for that long. And you know what, Jonah did. That's exactly what happened with Jonah here. And one thing I want to point out, this whale is really in two verses in the entire book of Jonah. The whale is not the main character, so don't get caught up in what the whale is doing. The whale was an instrument of God. Who is the main character of this story? Jonah. Jonah. God. Oh, I hear that. <clears throat> this story is about God's mercy. It's about God's compassion his love and his kindness towards people. That is the main theme of this book. So if you do have your Bibles or your little smartphones, you can get it out. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 1. we will be from Jonah chapter 1. If you don't have it, fine. I have it right on the screen. All right. Jonah chapter 1. The Lord's word came to Jonah, Amatai's son. Get up and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their evil has come to my attention. So Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship heading for Tarshish. All right. So let's get some background on this story. By the way, if you find me in the slides... Again? No, I've been looking. You've been looking. <laughs> All right, so what we need to know, this story is taking place 785 B.C. So this is 780-some years before Jesus comes into the story. The name Jonah does mean dove. Amatai means faithfulness. So there's an irony there that Jonah, who is so unfaithful, running from God, but his name means the son of faithfulness here. But we need to understand, why did Jonah, after God said, go here, he was like, no. He ran from God. We need to know who the Ninevites are. 
and they are Assyrians. And we have the ruins of Nineveh. You can go there. It's in modern-day Iraq today. And you can explore even the palace, the ruins of it still today. And we can learn something about who the Assyrians were outside biblical texts. And we find out that they were ruthless, ruthless people, just from the images that they carved on their palace walls. They were notorious in war. When they <coughs> conquered the city, they would impale people on stakes. That's what we see up here. They're impaling their victims on these long spears. They would rape, they would burn the city, they would chop off hands, and they will rip out the tongues and flay people alive, and they will mutilate the dead. This is a picture of a man who is being forced to grind up the bones of his family who the Assyrians killed. Does these sound like bad people to you? Yes. Not someone you want to go and say how much God's love to them or give them warnings. No, you don't. And when they conquered somebody, um, a nation, a city, they will take the prisoners that they wanted to keep alive to use as slaves, they will hook them in their mouth with a hook and drag them behind their caravan as they go. Guys feeling good? <laughs> this is as much as detail as give to seventh grade, so you guys can handle this, I know. Jonah wants, God wants Jonah to go there. Imagine it's 1942, the middle of World War II, and God called a Jewish man to go to Berlin to preach to the Nazis. Would they go? Could they go? Imagine other people who have escaped justice throughout history. Uh, me and Miss Barnett, we were watching some documentaries about Nazis who escaped justice after World War II. Joseph Mengele, have you heard of him? He was known as the angel of death. He's the one that got to decide, you go to the work camps, you go to the gas chambers. And then he performed awful scientific research on people, experiments, mostly on children. This guy escaped after the end of the war. He moved to South America, living under a different identity. And he was never caught. We didn't know he was in South America until after he died and was buried um, in South America. But what if someone called Will? Go to Joseph Mengele and tell him the good news of the gospel. Or someone else, if you took my history class, um, if you know Roy Bryant, oh. J.W. Malam, Caroline Bryant. Do those names familiar? Two men who mutilated a 14-year-old boy before killing him. Huh? Emmett Till. Oh, yeah. So imagine Oswin. Go to J.W. Bryant and tell him the good news of Jesus. Both those men got off. They were never punished for what they did. They had double jeopardy, which is a hole in the system of the U.S. government, that they were never punished because a court found them innocent one time. Or how about Dolores Umbridge? Does she ever get punished no. for what she did to her students, no. making them write, I must not tell lies on the back of their hands. Dorothea, can you go to Dolores Umbridge and tell her the good news about Jesus? No. <laughs> You're going to hesitate. <laughs> You'd be like, God, anybody but them. I cannot go to them. And that's what Jonah said. That's why he ran away. Because he knew God was a merciful God. He knew that God had mercy for the Assyrians, for the people of Nineveh. And he thought their mer that mercy was undeserved. Well, of course, mercy for us is undeserved, too. And he doesn't go because he knows God has a tendency for showing mercy. So he tries to get away from God. But you can't do that. You can't run from God. In one of David's psalms, Psalms 139, it says, No matter where you go, how high, how low you descend, you will never escape the presence of God. But Jonah's going to try. Oh, let's go. Yes, there. 
So he's from Joppa here, which is northern Israel. God's telling him to go 500 miles this way to Nineveh. But he's going to go all the way to Spain. <laughs> exact opposite direction. And I'm pretty sure he was going to keep going even when he got to Spain. Maybe he was just going to build a boat, find the new world way before Columbus did. He was running as fast as he could in the exact opposite direction. But he could not escape God. Because when you run from God, you are always running in the wrong direction. Okay, we're going to read Jonah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Okay, verse 4, let me find it. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, so that there was a great storm on the sea. The ship looked like it might be broken to pieces. The sailors were terrified, and each one cried out to his god. They're pagans. These are pagan gods. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to make it lighter. Now Jonah had gone down into the hold of the vessel to lie down and was deep in sleep. The ship's officer came and said to him, How can you possibly be sleeping so deeply? Get up! Call on your god! Perhaps the god will give some thought to us so that we won't perish. Meanwhile, the sailors said to each other, Come on, let's cast lots so that we might learn who is to blame for this evil thing happening to us. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us, since you are caused this evil happening to us, what do we do? Where are you from? What country and of what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Sometimes we get stuff happens to us. This storm could be intentional, these storms in our lives. And these sailors, they're going to have good intentions throughout this thing, this whole um, event. Because if we keep reading from verse 10, the men were terrified and said to him, What have you done? The men knew that Jonah was fleeing from the Lord because he had told them. Then the men were a terror. Okay. They said to him, What will we do about you so that the sea will become calm around us? The sea was continuing to rage. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm around you. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. The men rowed to reach dry land. Imagine that. He said, throw me into the sea. And the sailors are like, no, we're going to try to still get out of this. They did not want to throw Jonah overboard. They continued to row, but they couldn't manage it because the sea continued to rage against them. So they called on the Lord saying, please, Lord. Now they're calling to God not to pagans. They are talking to the God. Don't let us perish on account of this man's life, and don't blame us for innocent blood. You are the Lord. Whatever you want, you can do. Then they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. The men worshiped the Lord with profound reverence. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made solemn promises. So now these pagans, they are not Jewish. These <laughs> Gentiles, they are now turning to God in this story. Meanwhile, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Don't mistake God's protection for punishment. That whale was God's mercy for Jonah. The whale was God's mercy for Jonah. He's going to give Jonah another chance to set things right. Now, if you're reading through all of Jonah, chapter 2 is all about Jonah inside the fish, or the whale, and he's giving a prayer to God. 
about three days in, Jonah is going to say, all right, Lord, what you ask, I will do. And then the Lord will say to the fish, spit him up, vomit him up on dry land. So now, oh my goodness, Mia was ready. Mia always gets it. I have a question. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I always get it. You always get it. They're not Photoshop anymore. It's like painted. Yeah. Uh, like, no. Is that challenge? No, Because that guy's wearing a baseball cap. Are you the one and with the girl? Overalls. I hate him. Are you the girl looking? I'm in that. Oh! Alright, we're in Jonah chapter 3 now. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city. A three days walk across. So if you go to Nineveh, if you wanted to get from one end to the other, it's going to take you three days. Three days to walk it. That's longer than it's going to take you to walk the island of Manhattan. That would take you one day. So we're talking about three times the size of Manhattan, the city of Nineveh. Jonah started into the city walking one day. He reached one day in and he cried out, just 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. When the word of it reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, stripped himself of his robe, covered himself with mourning clothes, and sat in ashes. So, that was a very short sermon that Jonah just gave. Actually, in Hebrew, this entire sermon is only five words. In 40 days' time, Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he says. He just declared that and he probably got out of there. And if you notice, in that sermon, Jonah didn't say anything about what they were doing wrong, what sin it was, who's going to overturn them, or what they should do. It said nothing about God. But he said what he came to say. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. But that's all it took for these people to realize we need to change. We need to do something. It seems that God knew the people of Nineveh's hearts way before he said Jonah. He knew that all the people of Nineveh needed was someone just to tell them, just tell them to stop it. Should I have a short story? Do I have time? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you some of my kindergarten trauma. I had some of the worst experience a kindergartner can have. And if I took therapy, we would just like rehash kindergarten about it. I went to kindergarten in the 1990s. Yes, I'm old. And, but in Alabama, and in that state in the 90s, they allowed teachers to hit the kids, like actually paddle them. So my kindergarten teacher was really, really mean. She screamed at us almost every day. She threatened us with the paddle. We watched as she paddled our classmates all the time. And I remember one time at, during playtime or centers, I went up to two girls and I just pointed at them and I, and I said, can I play with you? And then out of nowhere, the teacher comes up to me and starts screaming at me. I don't know what she was screaming, I can't remember that, but I just remember the teacher was mad at me. I did something wrong. I don't know why asking someone to, can I play with you? I don't know why that was so bad, but those two girls told me later, I don't know if you know this, but when you pointed at us, you used this finger, and you're not supposed to do that. I was like, I didn't know that. So then I knew I never did that ever again. <laughs> I was very self-conscious about what finger I used to point at people then after that moment. But 
That's all I needed, somebody to tell me what I was doing was wrong. And then I never did that. I could have used without the teacher screaming at me the whole time. Uh, but that's what wrath looked like. And that's wrath. I never got the paddle. That didn't happen to me, but I was terrified I would. Um, and a couple years later, I moved to Michigan. It was my own underground railroad that I escaped to the north. And I came home, and I was like, Mom, they don't hit kids at school. This is paradise. I love school now. It's so great. Um, so we think Jonah may have been trying to sabotage his own message, thinking like, God, I don't want them to be saved. But the people of Nineveh, their hearts were ready, and they were ready to turn away. And so the city was overturned. This is the Hebrew word for overturned, mehupek. I guess that's how you say it. But if you look up, there's many different ways we can look at being overturned, because the city was overturned. Overturned can be destroyed. The entire city was destroyed, or we can see it as this city, after 40 days, was completely transformed. It was no longer recognized as those awful, ruthless people from Nineveh. Oh, I'm glad you say that. Okay. As a child of the 90s, we had etch-a-sketches were what we played on all the time. We didn't have phones to play with. We had this one little device, and it had two knobs. You turn the right one, the little dot, it could draw a picture, just a line going right to left. If you turn the left one, the line could go up and down. And you could make a picture Usually never turned out pretty, but like I spent hours trying to make the perfect picture. But if I made one mistake, it was all ruined. But all I needed to do was overturn it, and the whole thing will go away, and it will start new. And I had a new canvas that I can start over with. So that's what an etch sketch is. I'm going to look for one in Turkey, so we can play with one. Because they were so fun. I, I used to have God will never run out of second chances for you. And yes, that's everyone's favorite uncle. He has a beautiful line in episode 212 of ATLA, Avatar Last Airbender, where he says, I believe you can change your life around. I believe in second chances. And God is the God who believes in second chances for us. Has anybody seen the VeggieTale movie, Jonah? No. Yes, you know the song? Like Jonah is a prophet? Oh, you have like a. Yeah, I can Sing it. I don't really watch it. Did you just say back in my day? Did you just sing so much? Sorry, back in the day. It's like five years old. Yeah. All right, this is a verse. I want you guys, if you can, Try to memorize this verse, because the book of Jonah ends kind of strangely and very abruptly, that you think, like Jonah, that he's watching Nineveh be saved. He's actually very bitter about this. He goes up to watch Nineveh be destroyed, and he's just angry, and he just starts raging at God. It's like, God, let me die. I would rather die here. Because my little plant that was keeping me sa shade, it was now dried up. And now I can't watch the city be burned up. He was just mad. He just asked to die. And that's kind of where we leave Jonah in the book of Jonah. We don't know what God's response was. Well, uh, well, God's response, yes, he told Jonah, like, who are you to complain? You didn't make the tree. I made the tree. You didn't make the people of Nineveh. I did. We don't know what Jonah's response to that was. If he was like, okay, God, I get it. Or was he just bitter for the rest of his life about this? But we do know there is a greater and better, better Jonah that is out there. And I know this is not in your packet, but if you want to write it down, you can. The story of Jonah is pointing to Jesus. Because Jesus is the true and better Jonah. 
Jonah was commanded to preach the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. Something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah said he would rather die than go to those sinners. Jesus said, I will die for those sinners. Because something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah was thrown into the storm for his own sin. And Jesus was thrown into a storm of God's wrath for our sin. Something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah was in a fish for three days and three nights and then vomited out. Jesus was in the grave for three days. And then he was resurrected. Because something greater than Jonah is here. God sent Jonah to save one nation. But God sent his son to save all nations. Every tongue, every tribe will be know the name of Jesus. Because something greater than Jesus, Jonah is here. Is Moses and Jonah mm -hmm. at the same time? Because a lot of the Old Testament points us to Jesus. Yes. Um, so I'm going to pray us out, guys. For this. God, we thank you that you are a merciful God. When we think of the Assyrians and how ruthless, how brutal they were, and you went to Jonah to, so he could go and speak to them because you knew they were worth saving. Thank you for having mercy on us when we don't deserve your mercy. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. Thank you that we can approach you with our struggles. You are forgiving God even when we re rebel and try to run from you. And we try to run for your will for us. You are a loving God. And help us to know this here at Oasis, here in Ankara, to continue to walk um, in your mercy and that we will um, also exhibit this compassion to our own enemies. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, you have some discussion questions that you're going to break up and go through. But first, Jonesy, cousin, do you have instructions for um, us? Our, yeah, I think just go with our regular groups. If your group has not a lot of people and you want to join with another group, that's also okay. But I think probably we have a good amount. All right, I think we're going to answer that.